So I'd like to thank everybody for coming out this evening. Um, Carly Lee Hall, um, Carly Hall is going to be talking us to us tonight. I'll tell you a little bit about Carly. Is um, um, Carly Hall is a registered physical therapist and neuroscience researcher. She is currently at the University of Waterloo as a PhD candidate, where she studies the influence of emotional state as a modulator of autonomic nervous system and somatic nervous system activity in postural control and balance. Recently, as she has been translating knowledge on this topic to clinicians, as well as practical techniques and strategies that can be taught to clients to address the influence of emotional state and um, <clears throat> pardon me, and nervous system dysregulation on their symptoms and condition. So thank you very much for joining us, Carly. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here with you guys. Fantastic. Now, I Carly's going to talk, um, do her talk. It'll be about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. And then after that, we will have questions. So if we can just maybe hold off the questions till then, and if everybody could mute um, their mic, I would appreciate it. Um, and we'll, we'll get started. Perfect, okay, I will share my screen again here. <clears throat> just gonna make sure I have the right. Um, and I'll just move this bar. There we go. Okay, so can you all see that okay? I think everybody's muted. I Are you I, able I, to see it, Kelly? I can. Um, okay. okay, perfect. Uh, many people over here, though. So here we it go. It looks like they're nodding, so that's good. Okay, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> if you have trouble hearing me or seeing it, just let Kelly know um, in the chat or something. Okay, so yeah, I I normally give this talk, um, I won't be giving the same talk, but a, a version of this talk based on my research um, and kind of integrating the research that I've been reading within this field um, to healthcare professionals. So I've worked to kind of um, like change the terminology. There's a lot more, um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with a lot of these terms, but if there's terms that you haven't heard, um, you can always ask me to clarify those. Um, so yeah, I wanted to really focus on the strategies and techniques that we can use to address the effect of our emotional state and you know stress and the regulation of our nervous system on physical symptoms, pain, and cognitive function. So I think it's really empowering to have the knowledge behind you know how how these things are related. Um, but by no means feel like you need to walk away from the session knowing all of this stuff to be able to do the techniques properly. Um, you definitely don't. So I just think it can be really empowering to understand because um, it can help explain why some symptoms maybe are worse at times of stress or or things like that. So yeah, again, there might be some detail in here about certain things, but don't feel like you need to really take away all of that the I'll kind of go over the main points at the end for for strategies and things and I can even send an email to Kelly with um, like the steps for the the different strategies that you can use um, to help regulate your nervous system. Um, so yeah don't feel overwhelmed if if this kind of is new to you that some of this information. Um, okay, so yeah as. As Kelly said, I'm a physical therapist. I graduated from U of T in 2013, and then I practiced for a while, and I was really interested in this topic. So I've been working on the PhD, and I'm in the kind of final, uh, you know, year of that. Um, so yeah, we're gonna spend some time going over the mind-body connection, provide some evidence behind these different techniques, and then um, a practical demonstration of different techniques that you can use that are have been shown they have so much research behind them they're not my techniques they're techniques that i found that have a lot of evidence to back them up um, and people can have a lot of healing with these type of techniques if they use them over time 
So we'll go over those things. Um, we're just going to start by going over the importance of addressing these techniques, talking about what is emotional state, what really is pain, um, going over how emotional state and the nervous system regulation affect physical body and pain perception, talking about some of the evidence behind these strategies that you can use, and then just some time to just conclude and to kind of summarize main key points, takeaways for what you can do, strategies to help yourself uh, with symptom management or healing and things like that. Okay, so first we'll just talk about the relevance. So we, this is well known within research that we know a emotional state and our, our ability to regulate our nervous system. Um, and sometimes you'll hear the term like the psychosocial state of an individual. Um, so there's a lot of research showing that that state of the individual really influences their prognosis. So how they will do following an injury. And one example of that, there's a study where um, they looked at people who had been in motor vehicle accidents. And one of the strongest predictors of how well someone does following an injury um, wasn't the severity of the injury. It was um, if they felt like there was uh, injustice done to them in that accident. And it just shows how strongly our our emotional system is wired with our um, system for sensing, like the sensory system and our, our motor system and things like that. And I also want to clear up that that is a very real thing. So a lot of times people will say, oh, the peop someone said my pain's in my brain. <laughs> and it is, that's where we perceive pain, but it's, it's always real. That's a real physiological thing. So that's something to keep in mind too. And, and we can use these techniques to address kind of that aspect of pain uh, or other symptoms that you might be having. So um, yeah, our, our brain is always talking to our bodies and different parts of our brain are always talking to each other. And the thoughts that we think and the way we feel influence our pain levels and can influence the way we move, the way we breathe, how we hold our posture, the sensations we experience, um, including, you know, sensitivity to certain um, stimuli. And obviously there's changes that happen with, with brain injuries that, um, that, you know, the, this is going to influence, but it's not the only thing that affects, you know, the way we're perceiving sensations and, and things like that. But it is something that we can work on to really help regulate our nervous system and improve symptoms. So yeah, I just wanna talk briefly about what is emotional state. So um, this is one of the more wordy slides, <laughs> but just to go over that as we go about our day, um, our bodies, we're gonna be having these responses to our environment and to our thoughts that we're thinking through the day. Uh, as our brain and bodies kind of, our nervous system receives this information, um through the day it's going to change our our biochemistry in our body so let's say someone is feeling really joyful and happy they're going to in real time have different hormones released into their body like oxytocin serotonin things like that and if they move into kind of like an anxious state their their body's going to adjust to that very quickly in real time and they'll release cortisol and other stress hormones and so we're always kind of shifting through this different, these, these different uh, states within our brain, but also within our physical body in terms of um, biochemistry and things like that. So yeah, within our brain and our brainstem, when we have changing emotions, we get changes in arousal level, changes in cognitive function, like attention, memory, behavioral strategies. This has all been shown with research. And, Within our, within our bodies, um, emotions involve these endocrine changes, like I talked about hormone changes. So the endocrine system is hormonal system. Autonomic, which um, that's the system in our body. I don't know if you've heard of this, but the autonomic nervous system, where we have these two branches, which is the rest and digest and the fight or flight or the, or the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Um, and that those that part of the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, 
regulates the function of all of our organs and our glands and um, yeah, changes in emotional state will in real time change the way that the signals we're getting from the autonomic nervous system to those various body systems. And then also our muscles and our, our sensory systems as well. We often turn, say feelings are the conscious experience of these changes, these physiological changes in our brain and body. And then emotional state is sort of all of that together. So those changes within our body, we might feel if we're angry, heat, we might feel uh, our heart is racing, we might feel our muscles tense, our jaw tense, and we have a conscious perception of that. And that's sort of what our emotional state is. Um, so pain, this is another one I really think is important to understand because, um, and you don't need to know this <laughs> picture over here, but it's just to show um, the insula here. So that's a part of our brain. That's where we perceive pain. And there's a lot of complex connections to that area. We don't need to understand that for the purpose of this, but just to say that, the, so the definition of pain is a complex sensory and emotional experience uh, that can vary widely between people, but also within a person, depending on the context and meaning of the pain. So what meaning they bring to that pain. Um, so like, oh, you know, that that pain is dangerous for me versus, okay, I just, you know, my ankle's a little sore after I twisted. That type of context that someone might have with their pain will influence how they feel it and how intense it is. And also the psycho psychological state of that person. So like whether they're in a happy mood or, um, you know, a more like a stress or anger or whatever, that there's a lot of research that shows that will change the intensity of the pain that they perceive um, to a given pain stimulus. So yeah, it's just something that I think is important to understand because if you're having things, you know, pain or headaches, things like that, we can really make a difference to those symptoms with um, altering kind of emotional regulation and things like that. Um, so now we're gonna go over, this is just the statement I have here where emotional state and nervous system dysregulation influence the physical body and pain perception and that is like there's a, a whole uh, breadth of very strong evidence to support that um, and so it's what we do with that knowledge that can really empower us right so um also want to mention when i when i say nervous system dysregulation or nervous system regulation what i'm mostly referring to is that um a large part of that is our autonomic nervous system and really balancing those two kind of uh, sides of it. So like the parasympathetic or rest and digest and the sympathetic uh, or that kind of fight or flight. Those are always um, our body wants to maintain balance. And that's what we're sort of doing when there's a nervous system dysregulation. Usually what's happening is that fight or flight system is engaged more through the day. And that's very common um, because of the pace of lifestyles and, um, you know, stress and worry and things like that. So what we want to do is really bring that back into balance. And, and that's what a lot of these techniques really help to do. And in turn, that, that balance helps to regulate all of our body systems. So we can influence a lot of different symptoms um, with these types of techniques. So we, we know there's emotional networks in the brain. They call it the limbic system. And they operate, again, this is sort of repeating myself, but um, by influencing the autonomic nervous system, which govern the function of our organs and glands, the endocrine system, which is um, our herm hormonal system, and then the somatic nervous system, which is um, how we interpret sensory information, so visual input, auditory input, um, you know, the vestibular input from our inner ear, touch, things like that, and then also smells, all of that, and then the musculoskeletal system, so we send signals through our nerves to move our muscles, and that is influenced, those processes are influenced by emotional networks as well. 
So the connection and sharing information through these connections is how incoming sensory information or visceral, which is our uh, information our, our brain receives from our organs, um, can affect the way that we feel and our emotional states and how our thoughts can influence output um, and how we perceive these sensory stimuli and also changes in the autonomic nervous system, such as muscle tone, heart rate, breathing, et cetera. So you don't need to know any of this, uh, but this is just to go over the, the fight or flight response, because this is something that um, individuals have been found. It's been found that 70, so individuals spend about 70% of their day in this kind of more elevated stress response or fight or flight response. Um, and so that's something we want to try to bring that system kind of back into balance with the rest and digest system. And when someone's in sort of like a, there's a spectrum of how intense is this fight or flight response or the stress response in our bodies. Um, and really, yeah, there's a, there's sort of like a range, but this is sort of showing like, say you saw a bear and you were going to run from the bear. Um, this intensity would result in um, changes in the way we process information through our senses. So tunnel vision, um, auditory exclusion, people will get fast breathing, tension in the muscles. Uh, the blood moves away from our organs to our muscles so we can get out of harm's way. And um, that's not a that's not a, a sort of state where it facilitates growth and repair and healing. And so if we're spending, you know, 70% of our day in that state based on our thoughts and, you know, stressors and things like that, um, that's not a lot of time in the day for us to, our systems to truly heal and, and regenerate and things like that. So we can really help the body to, to heal and, you know, symptoms to improve if we give it the, the body, the proper environment um, for that to happen. But when we're in these kinds of states of this increased sympathetic activation, it's a harder, it's not a state where we're going to be regenerating as easily. Um, everybody gets stress. This system is there for a reason. It's important for us. We need to have this system there. It's, it's not that it's bad, but it's the balance between the two that is important. Um, so yeah, we're, it's a very useful system for many reasons. And I've put that on this next slide, but something to note is that that response that I just talked about, it's the same response in our bodies, whether we're running from a bear or we're getting stressed at work or about a health condition or whatever it may be, or just simply thinking about that stressor to us. So humans are sort of um, unique in that we can engage that stress response by thought alone. So there doesn't need to be something actually threatening in our environment. But if we're thinking, oh my gosh, uh, you know, I have people coming over tonight and I'm worried about what to make them like that will engage that system a little bit, right? So short term, this is very adaptive, uh, an adaptive response because it, it mobilizes the energy to deal with the situation at hand but it's not a like running from a, a bear say but it's not a state for us to again heal and regenerate in and so chronically if we're in this state uh chronically for a long time um for a large part of our day and over time this is more maladaptive because it's not a state for growth and repair so that's where these techniques come in to really help balance this response with um, the parasympathetic system to really help uh, facilitate these these the opportunity to heal and repair and things like that. So I already said this, but individuals spend a large portion of their day in some degree of this sympathetic increased sympathetic activation or fight or flight response that's shown in the research. And especially if individuals have experienced trauma of any kind. So whether it's a physical trauma or you know, a lot of times physical traumas are emotional traumas as well, but certainly just emotional traumas even. Um, it sort of throws off the balance to these systems and 
um, restoring that balance is a key part of healing um, that sometimes gets left out um, because there's other more maybe pressing things to do right away. Um, and sometimes it gets lost in translation. So um, just to go over briefly again, this, this in kind of context of an injury, say, for example, so say you have an injury and that can be the stressor in this case. It could be also a stressor of, oh, I have this thing due for work and need to get it done. Or, oh, someone important to me is coming over for dinner and I really want to impress them with this meal, like all those kinds of things. But we'll talk about an injury um, kind of in the context of that. So the stimulus is the injury. We have a reaction in our brain to that stimulus so that's a stress response sorry a stress perception and then that will activate a physiological flight or a fight or flight response in our bodies and that's the stress response and that's a normal healthy thing when you have an injury your sympathetic nervous system is going to be on high alert to one if there's a still a danger to you get you out of that situation um help you do what you need to do to be safe and then um, be on high alert about the environment to protect yourself and high alert to protect your body right and that's where we get this muscle guarding and things like that and that's very healthy and and normal we we want that response because we want to protect our bodies early on in an injury and then what should happen if the conditions are right in the body um in terms of just like this balance between the autonomic systems um, is that as the tissues heal and things improve in our physical bodies and in the you know the the brain and all of that um, healing process occurs we'd like to see that balancing out of the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems um, to really facilitate you know, continual symptom improvement. But what can happen is we end up, um, this, every, everyone has these thoughts like worrying about, oh, am I gonna get aggravated by this? Or, or just that kind of the shock of that injury being so much that it just elevates that system and it's not without sort of some attention to it to bring it back down into balance that we can really restore that homeostasis or that balance within our body. And so sometimes it takes a bit of focus. So what can happen is you can have these, this tissue healing, but still have the same symptoms uh, intensity, even though the tissues have healed because the bodies go still um, really sort of like on high alert to things like light or noise or, um, you know, movement or whatever it may be. Um, and so this is one aspect of healing that we want to work on is balancing out these, these systems to really facilitate um, changes in symptoms. So yeah, just wanted to point out if you're experiencing, um, this is not an exhaustive list, there's so many other things that, that are linked, but just a few here. Uh, so pain, things like headaches, um, pain of any kind, muscle tension or tone, muscle activation uh, or st strength issues, balance issues, sensory processing issues, um, hypersensitivity to environmental inputs like noise or light, issues with postural um, control, attention, focus, memory, then you're dealing with something that's directly related to and influenced by emotional state and nervous system regulation. So we want to always have that as part of the puzzle, right? It's not the only thing, but part of the puzzle um, to your healing with whatever else you're you're doing, right? Um, so yeah, spending time rebalancing our system is is really key after trauma, and it's part an important part of recovery. Um, so now we'll go over the evidence and the practical demonstrations of these techniques. Um, uh, does anybody feel like they need like a minute break to move their eyes away from the screen or anything? <laughs> okay, to keep going. We'll just pause for a second if anybody needs to stretch or, you know, want to look out the window to let your eyes kind of focus further away. I'll just 
take a second there. Okay. So, yeah, we'll go over this next part. And the first the first technique is there's so much evidence behind this technique and people have had like real healing on, on a lot of different types of symptoms from cognitive function to, you know, um, things like pain and um, changes in immune system function. And there's just a whole host of, of basically this is related to all systems of your body. And uh, this is called a heart coherence technique. And there's a lot of research on this. Um, so if anybody's interested on that research, I can provide some links and things like that. But first, I just want to give a little bit of background because I think it helps us to understand partly, you know, maybe explaining some of the things behind our symptoms, not not the only influences, but a part of it. And then also just, as I said, really, if you understand why you're doing something, you're more likely to do it regularly. And, and these types of techniques we want to do regularly. So just strengthens the intention behind it. But again, don't feel like you need to go away knowing all of this and be able to re-explain it to everybody. But um, yeah, so I don't know if you've heard of heart rate variability, but when we, we can measure the heart heart um, electrical signal by by looking at ECG, so electrocardiograms, it just, that's when you see that heartbeat trace that we're used to seeing, that's what, that's what we're measuring is the electrical activity in the heart. And heart rate variability is the, the time difference in milliseconds between each of these beats. And it's influenced by stressors and emotional state and things like that. And, um, it's an index, meaning it's it reflects the autonomic nervous system activity. So we can get a lot of helpful information about the state of the balance of the nervous system with heart rate variability. And um, what is important to note is that this heart rate variability, so we want, we want there to be differences in time between each beat that we're seeing. We want there to be variability. We don't want them to be all the same time. If there's more variability, that that is reflective of a healthy um, autonomic nervous system. So um, they have correlated heart rate variability within. So there's a relationship between heart rate variability in the research and these things. Again, this is an, an exhaust, exhaustive list by any means, but some of the main things are heart uh, health and well-being, um, emotional regulation, postural control, cognition, attention, reaction time, memory, executive function, et cetera, et cetera. And having a high heart rate variability, so more variability between beats um, is associated with improved health and well-being. So they often can, um, in disease states, generally there's a low heart rate variability. In, in a, a wide variety of disease states. So yeah, a high, high, high rate, high heart rate variability is related to improved health and well-being, higher emotional well-being, lower levels of worry and rumination, lower anxiety, and generally more regulated responding in our nervous system. And it is normal. So this is something you can train and it's normal as we age for the heart rate variability to lessen, um, but even, you know, as we age, we can train it to uh, to raise that heart rate variability. And that's something that's really important for our health. And that's what this technique will help um, to address the sort of like that heart rate variability, how orderly is the heart rate pattern and things like that. Um, but yeah, like the, um, groups like the Navy SEALs and, um, you know, professional athletes, there a lot of them are using this technique because it's linked to performance on so many different levels, be it physical or, um, you know, emotional regulation, as I said, cognition, things like that. So if we look at this heart rate trace, this is the electrical activity, that heart beat. This is looking at the variability and in relaxed states, we see this nice kind of like orderly rhythm and there's lots of variability between beats, different time amounts between beats. And that's really good. 
when people are stressed, we see this lessening of the heart rate variability, so lower variability between beats. It's more rigid almost and, and disordered. And it's not something to be afraid of, like it's not going to cause harm to you, you know, in the short term to have that kind of um, state, right? And even in the long term, people can endure, you know, long times of stress, but the more we can really regulate our our heart rhythm, the the improvements in our health and our, and our symptoms will will come with that. Um, it's just a more optimal state for functioning of our body systems. So when we look at these heart rhythm patterns here, um, in sort of states where people feel frustration, anxious, worry, um, irritation, those types of emotional states are what they found in the research is that that tend to elicit these um, more disordered and less variability within that heart rate variability trace. And they find that that's not conducive to performance, right? Um, on any kind of, with it, in any of our body systems. And then when we experience these positive emotions like appreciation, love, care, we see this more orderly rhythm and more variability um, in the heart rate and this, yeah, again, ordered, orderly um, rhythm and this promotes uh, performance. So within our musculoskeletal system, within cognition, et cetera, et cetera. So we're almost done this section, we'll get to the technique, but the heart, just to note, the heart is always sending information or signals to the brain and the brain receives this information. This is um, well studied now. So there's a, an intrinsic network of neurons in your, in your heart that are sending signals to the brain. And those signals affect the way that the brain is functioning. And it influences our cognitive processes, how we interpret sensory information, our pain perception, how we think, how we feel, how our breathing, um, et cetera, et cetera. So if we can really do techniques to help regulate our coherence, we can affect these, these things really positively and have our body working in a way that's sort of more efficient um, and yeah, just promotes uh, a nice balanced state within our body. So learning to generate these this heart rhythm coherence by sustaining a positive positive emotions not only benefits the entire body but affects how we think how we perceive how we feel and perform. Um, and just to note that we're going to be doing so we're going to do the technique in a second, but sometimes because like everybody can get into these states now and again where you're like worried about something or there's a stress in your life. And sometimes it's, it can be hard to bring on that feeling, like a feeling of gratitude, and that's not uncommon. So um, breathing is really related to our, our regulation within our system. So just by slowing our breath, we're already causing this more coherent state and um, this balancing of our system. So if you can't bring on that that feeling um, at a given time, that's totally okay. You can use just your breathing to affect change. So we're gonna do that technique right now. So this is called the heart lock-in technique. And what you're gonna do is just focus your attention on the area of your heart. So I'll get you, if you're comfortable, close your eyes. If not, just have kind of like a relaxed gaze. <laughs> And I find it helps to put my hand on my like heart area. And so you can close your eyes. And I'm going to get you to imagine your breath flowing in and out of your, your heart or chest area. And you're going to breathe slower and deeper than usual. Just in a way that feels comfortable for you but try to see if you can do a little slower and deeper than normal. And then we're gonna get you to try to activate, activate this and sustain a regenerative feeling such as appreciation, gratitude, care, compassion. And I find it's helpful to think of someone or something you're grateful for, whether it's 
you just ate a really yummy meal or someone did something nice for you. Just try to bring that feeling up. And just try to hold that feeling as you're breathing. And then if you feel like you have that feeling there, imagine radiating that renewing feeling to your whole body and sort of out to others. Just imagine that feeling expanding. And if you haven't felt like you're really bringing on that feeling, that's that's totally fine. Just having that breathing, slowing and being aware of our heart area. We're causing changes within our system that are really positive for our body. To our autonomic nervous system. Okay, and then when you're ready, you can just start to bring your awareness kind of more to the room that you're in and back to sort of me talking. <laughs> and yeah, so this type of technique, normally you might practice it for like five minutes. There's lots of studies showing now that even doing this five minutes twice a day has a profound effect on the cardiovascular system, on the respiratory system, um, the autonomic nervous system. It can really help over time to restore balance. So I'll go over sort of like recommendations for, for doing this, but just know that even if you're only able to do a little bit of time, uh, you know, all at once or twice a day or something, uh, you're going to start making some real real change to your system and overall that starts to rebalance the system and then when you're functioning through the day your system is is more balanced and it sort of all just builds on on each other and um, the more you practice the better you'll get and the more changes you'll feel right so yeah but also it's learning to to kind of hone the skill it takes some time at the beginning so just be patient with yourself um it's I would recommend even doing this technique in real time if if symptoms are flaring up or if you know you're gonna you know you're in traffic and you're stressed um, use this technique to kind of center yourself because the more we can um, if we feel ourselves kind of getting into that stress state or an aggravation in symptoms we can use this to bring that balance restore a little bit more balance at that time it can be really effective um, if you're going to be doing something that you know aggravates your symptoms, maybe do this before and halfway through and at the end and just see over time if, if that's making a difference for you. The next one's just brief. Um, well, we're almost done, so I'll just go over this one briefly, but this is called physiological sigh. So um, it's just based on there's a whole lot of kind of things I could describe behind it, but basically when you actively exhale, you del your brain sends a signal to deliberately slow down the heart rate. And this can help if you're feeling stressed or anxious. So this is something you can kind of do in real time again. Um, and it works very quickly. So basically um, what you would do is you inhale through your nose. If you can't breathe through your nose, you can do your mouth, but try to do your nose. You inhale through your nose with another layered inhale on top, and then you actively exhale with a sigh. And you would do about three to five breaths like that. And it can really help to just like help to balance that stress response um, with more parasympathetic or rest and digest kind of activation of that parasympathetic nervous system. So let's just try a couple breaths like that just so you can get the hang of it. So you breathe in through your nose again and then exhale. And then again in through your nose another layered breath and exhale with a sigh. So that's something I think um, is a good one to kind of use in real time. I think I forgot to mention too with the, the coherence, um, that one you can do with your eyes open. So like if you're in a, you know, a conversation with someone and you're feeling like you're getting aggravated or triggered by something, 
you know, you can use that technique with your eyes open. No one's going to know you're doing it, but just like really trying to generate that feeling or just even slowing your breath just by being more aware of your breath and kind of breathing more into your chest or using your diaphragm versus just this kind of like shallow breathing more up here can make such a difference to your, to your body and to your symptoms and the balance of that nervous system. Um, so last thing, this, we're not going to do a meditation today. I'll make a recommendation of a couple ones that I think are really good, but just to say that, um, there's lots of different types of techniques. There's a lot of great research coming out of the university of, uh, California, San Diego on this particular, uh, Joe Dispenza's meditations. There's a lot of really powerful, um, research coming out of there showing like healing that people are doing with, with that type of uh, meditation technique. I find mindfulness meditation, a lot of people are familiar with it. So I chose that for this, this talk. And this is a nature paper. So nature is a really, really um, well-known journal. Um, so it's like, if you're reading something from nature, you know, it's really solid research. Um, and this is a review paper. So they're looking at many different studies and kind of compiling the research. And what they found was, that eight regions in the brain when you meditate even novel new meditators uh, consistently eight regions in the brain tend to get structurally altered meaning the you're growing new neurons and new kind of connections between neurons in those areas and that can help with a whole host of um, functions and one i wanted to point your attention to was the changes in sensory cortices, so the areas of your brain that um, perceive things like light and smell and, and touch and things like that. And as well as the insula, which is, if you remember, where you perceive pain. So if you have like um, sensitivity to light, to noise, um, if you're experiencing pain, if you're experiencing headaches, um, this type of technique can really cause some changes, some positive changes in, the, in those brain regions. Um, with practice. So yeah, we just see this more regulated nervous system, more balance in the in the autonomic nervous system, um, a kind of improved return to like the baseline balance after a exposure to a stressor. And that's what we're really going for. Of course, everybody has stressors, but just a, a, an improved kind of return to that stress, um, to that level of balance is important. Um, one other thing with meditation when we're functioning um there's so we can measure brain waves just like we measure the heart activity we can measure brain activity because uh, that's how our brain works we're sending these electrical signals and when there's different don't worry about the slides kind of busy but when we are in different kind of levels of thought or um, different things that we're doing through the day we have varying brain waves so when we're stressed we have these kind of high beta brain waves where there's a, a lot it's a higher frequency and also the areas of our brain a different neural networks or different areas in our brain aren't communicating as well to each other and one thing that meditation and the and the heart coherence technique does is that it slows the brain waves down um, meditation does to a lower frequency and it and also allows different parts of the brain to communicate better with each other. So they become more synchronous and um, function more as a team. And so training that through this type of technique or the heart coherence can be so helpful for your functioning. So you can think of coherence kind of like when you're in that kind of coherence state or that balanced state, you're, it's like drummers all beating to the same rhythm. All the different parts of your nervous system are functioning well together and that's why we see this perform this improved performance um and when there's more of this incoherent or stress state it's like all these drummers beating at different <laughs> rhythms and it's not going to be uh, as effective right so we're not going to do the technique but i will send it the mindful movement ones are really great but i'll, I'll send that to kelly and then just the concluding remarks here so the human body has innate healing capability. So we have the we have the power to take our healing into our own hands with the help. We're still I'm not saying do this on only this. You're going to continue doing everything you're doing. 
seeing who you need to see. Um, but we have the power to really take our healing into our own hands as well. And to give our body that state, um, that balanced state that we can really facilitate growth and repair and healing in. And by regulating our nervous system, we can facilitate change to our symptoms. Um, so I'm not going to go over these again, but basically all those symptoms I was talking about and more. Um, if you regulate your nervous system, you will over time start to see some some changes to these to these systems. So being in a heart coherent state improves your health and well being. This is all shown in research: emotional regulation, cognition, attention, memory, pain, immune system function, functioning with the cardiorespiratory system, so your heart and your breathing. Uh, and many more. So it's just, you can't go wrong really with doing these techniques. Everybody, it'd be great for everybody to do it. I do this daily, a few times a day. I meditate daily. The changes I've seen in my own body and health since I started doing that, it's like a total shift. So thankful I found these techniques. Um, and a little bit can go a long way. So even five minutes, twice a day of this, you know, do a meditation five minutes or do, you know, the heart coherence five minutes, twice a day, or even once a day with like anything, the more you practice, the benefits will build the techniques will you you'll practice them and it will improve even more over time. Um, you can start increasing the time that you're doing them. You can use them as real time stressors come up, as I said, like traffic, an argument with someone worrying a flare up in symptoms. And uh, yeah, with time and practice, you can facilitate a lot of change to the regulation of your nervous system, which is really helpful for your health um, and your symptoms. So remember, you have the power to heal your body. That's important to really grasp because it's so true. You can, you can do so much for yourself to heal. And um, it's not to say that it doesn't take a lot of time and attention and it doesn't take, you know, yeah, some time and, and some real focus on balancing, but we have the power to really make some changes within our system. And uh, yeah, it, it can take time. So just give yourself some grace if you're trying these and, you know, um, yeah, there's sort of like everybody has a different state that they're in. Everybody has a different injury. So, um, you know, everybody's going to respond differently. But even if you've had symptoms for a long, long time, we can make some real change with some of these techniques. So, yeah, so thank you so much. This is some information I'll give it to Kelly. She can pass on to you um, just my email and website where you can find some of these techniques and things. Again, they're not my techniques. They're just ones that I found are really helpful. So I know I went over in time here. These are the sort of like the references. But if you have some questions, I'll stop sharing my screen. Well, so it's like you. an information overload there probably, but. <laughs> oh, no, actually I found it incredibly helpful. Thank you so much, Carly. It's amazing what five minutes a day um, can do for you. So at this point now we'll take questions. Um, so just one second here. I'm just going to change a couple things. I'm just going to, um, does anybody have anything they were wondering about, about the techniques or any of the background or? Okay. I'm going to the recording now as well. So if anybody would like to go ahead and do ask questions, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Carly. No, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.